Salutations to the Truth Corps, whoever or wherever you may be on the planet. This is the eighth installment in Mythology 101, and the title is The Gnostic Warning. So finally the moment comes to open up the file on the right and to see what it says and what mythogen might be found in those materials. The source materials for the file on the right are the Nag Hammadi Codices and other works in Greek which have been attributed to the Gnostics or provide some evidence on the mysteries. And I must advise you, I must advise you that this material is extremely scant and it is in a bad condition of preservation. So the dossier for the Sophianic file, as we may call it, is presents problems of reconstruction of the evidence contained in that file. So this material has to be handled with great care and meticulous attention. Also, I would add that supplementary to the material coming from the mystery schools and from the Gnostic writings or writings attributed to them, there is also a vast body of work called the patristic writings, the writings of the early church fathers. That includes a huge set of volumes called the anti-Nicene writings, meaning before the Nicene Council of 325 AD. These writings, as I've explained in Not in His Image, comprise what may be called the dossier of the prosecution. The church fathers of early Christianity hated the mysteries and the Gnostics, and they compiled a file to condemn them. But in this file, there is certain evidence of what the Gnostics taught and even certain elements of the master narrative of the mysteries, the fallen goddess scenario, that cannot be found elsewhere. And as we'll see in this talk, there is one item in the dossier of the prosecution against the Gnostics That is essential to this investigation underway. So here we go. I'm going to reach over to the far right and bring over the Sophianic file, which is race-specific to the Aryan Caucasian peoples, the white races, and in particular to the root stock of the Aryan races represented by the ancient Persians who spoke the language of Avestan, which is an ancient form of Farsi. What I'm going to show you now, we haven't done so far, but everything I've said in the preceding seven talks builds up to this moment. We're going to open these two files simultaneously and compare them. Before I do so, however, I'm going to show you a little trick. This trick explains how I prepare the forensic question that I take in my approach to these two files. So I'm going to reach out to the stack of 40 files and I'm going to whip out three of them, like taking cards out of a deck. But I'm going to choose three cards from the same suit like the suit of clubs, for instance. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to choose three files that come from geographic locations in the world in proximity to each other. The Sumerian files in non-Semitic languages, the Egyptian file, and the Greek file. Now, if you picture the geographic situation, you see that the Sumerian files come from the Middle East, the Egyptian files from the Nile Valley, and 
the Greek files from the area of Greece, including the Greek islands. These three areas are in geographic proximity, and their cultures and peoples in ancient times were likewise in proximity, and they mingled with each other. So I'm taking three files in the same suit, and I'm asking the question, do you find in these three files the same entities under different names? Do you find mythological parallels? Or do you find, even better, to refine the question, that these files in some way refer to each other? Are there elements in Egyptian mythology that refer to the Sumerian material or to the Greek material and vice versa, the Greek to Sumerian, the Greek to Egyptian? Remember that all the clues in the world don't count unless you know what crime has been committed. So you go to the crime scene with a particular question. And the results of this question I'm posing now are immediately revealing. What you find is that yes, there are similar entities or parallel entities that appear under different names specific to those races and the languages they spoke. Just going to take one example again, because if I went into this at length, it would take the entire half hour of the talk. Let's take a well-known figure of Thoth from Egyptian mythology, the god of writing, the sacred scribe. Well, you find Thoth, or the equivalent in Greek mythology, as Hermes. And you find another figure representing the sacred scribe or the god or goddess who is associated with the art of writing in the Sumerian record as well. Remember, the non-Semitic language Sumerian record. Do you know who is the representative of the sacred scribe and who is attributed with introducing the art of writing in the Sumerian record? Well, that is actually a goddess named Nisaba. And curiously, if you look at the Egyptian material, of course, Thoth stands out as the great scribe and the fountainhead of the Hermetic literature, which is said to come from the Egyptian mysteries. But you also find a prominent figure in Egyptian myth, a goddess named Seshat. And bear in mind, by the way, that a goddess in quotes in Egyptian religion is not necessarily a divine entity, but may well simply be the leader of a certain priesthood or class of priesthood. So Seshat was a female figure associated with the art of writing and in particular with the keeping of historical records. So you find both the figures, Thoth and Seshat, in Egyptian myth with correspondences to Nisaba in the Sumerian and Hermes in the Greek materials. So you do find the evidence of similar entities, but that is not the key question I'm bringing to the material. question I'm bringing to the material is, do these three different files actually refer to each other? You see the difference? I'm not saying do they carry corresponding images or parallels, but do they actually refer? Is there anything in Egyptian mythology that refers to and directly addresses the contents of Sumerian myth or Greek myth? Is there anything in Greek myth that directly refers to Egyptian myth? Not simply by a parallel that you, acting as the comparative mythologist, might draw, but a direct connection by direct reference. That's how you form the key question. Looking at the Hebrew file on the left and the Sophianic file on the right, the question is, 
do these two bodies of material directly refer to each other? And the answer is yes. And the answer is in a most remarkable way, a unique way. There are unique and unparalleled references from the Hebrew file to the Gnostic file and vice versa. And this is anticipating a little, but I'm quite excited about what I'm telling you. So let me say that what gives away the game here is that the two dossiers do not only refer to each other, but they refer with a particular attitude. So the attitude in the Hebrew file toward the Gnostics and the Sophianic mystics is extremely hostile. And the attitude, as we shall see, in the Gnostic file toward the Hebrew file is critical. Critical. It critiques what is in the Hebrew file. Now, this is an absolutely, as far as I know, unparalleled instance in world mythology. In the written notes to accompany these talks, which you can find on Nemeta, I've established a set of parallels. But we know they're not parallels, are they? They're actually specific references, as if there were two authors of two different books, and each author cites the material of the other. And they do so in an adversarial manner. So there is, in fact, a contest going on between these two bodies of material and between the mythogens. There is a contest between the two mythogens in these two files. So those are my conclusions applying a forensic method to the treatment of comparative mythological materials. And now I'll show you how I reached those conclusions, and you can decide for yourself if they are valid or not. In the notes, you have a bullet point list of the elements in the Hebrew biblical Semitic myth that is unique to the ethnic strain of the Hebrew. And there are, at the top, five elements. And then I've included, in the pre-flood scenario, a couple of others, Adam and Eve, Seth, Noah. And then I've included, in the post-flood scenario, Abraham and Melchizedek and the races or descendants of Jewish people of the ancient Hebrews descended from Abraham, the supreme patriarch of the three world religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which are all variations of a single mythogen. In this bullet point list, I've singled out 10 elements. I'm going to go through them one by one. El, or Elian, that is Yahweh or Jehovah, the supreme creator God of the Hebrew, the Yehudin. Is there an equivalent or any reference to this entity in the Gnostic file? There is. It is called by the name Yeldabayot, and it is also called Saklas and Samael. So the Gnostics identified Jehovah according to that name, Two, the Elohim, the superspecies derived from Elian. Did the Gnostics identify that element? Yes, they did. They called them the Archons. So the Elohim are the Archons. Three, Adam, the Adamic race. Did the Gnostics identify the Adamic race, those who 
consider themselves to be a superspecies, an übervolk, standing above and beyond all the other races of humanity. Yes, they did. They identified the authors of the Hebrew file as the Adamic race. But they gave the profile, they gave a profile of the Adamic race that was completely different from that given by the authors of the other file. And see how this is developing. Number four, Eve. Remember, Eve represents the consort or wife of Adam, but according to Talmudic interpretation, she is the land of Israel. So Eve equates to the promised land in the Hebrew file. How did the Gnostics see that? Well, they saw that the true promised land is the earth, which belongs to all the races of humanity. It does not merely belong to one ethnic group because their creator God has promised it to them. So they had a critical view of the promised land and the chosen tribe to whom the promised land was promised by their tribal God. Five, Enoshut. The Hebrew name for humanity, which I've shown you, is problematic. Well, the Gnostics had another name for the entirety of the human species. Specifically, it is the name for the human genome, Anthropos. And so they saw the Anthropos as being Inoshut, the true definition of humanity, which, however, is not found in the Hebrew file. Or to put it in another way, the Hebrew file asserts that all of the races, the Gentiles, the Goyim, the nations of humanity, are an out-group compared to the in-group who authored the Hebrew file. Six, Adam and Eve. Well, how did the Gnostics view the figures of Adam and Eve in the mythology of the Semitic language peoples? Well, they saw it as a script which ought to have been about the true parents of humanity. So if you accept Adam and Eve as a poetic metaphor or a mythological trope for the true parents of humanity, then the Gnostics said the true parents of humanity are not human. They are, in fact, aeons, divine powers at the galactic core. They located where they are. And they named them Sophia, the mother, and Delete, the father, who designed the human genome. So they have a counter-narrative to the narrative in the Hebrew file. Are you seeing how that develops? Next, number seven. Well, this is a most intriguing factor in the Hebrew narrative, the book of Genesis says that Adam and Eve had three sons, Cain and Abel, and that story is well known, but they also had a third son who is described as being of another seed, Seth. What do you find out about Seth in the Gnostic file? Well, you find out that the authors of the file considered themselves to be the children of Seth. They are the Sethians. So there is a branch of Gnostic material recognized by all scholars called Sethian Gnosticism. And it is from that narrative and those materials, particular to the children of Seth, that the Sophianic myth comes down to the world today in its current form. So the children of Seth were the Magi. They were the members of the Magian order, and the Magian order is the deep prehistorical taproot of what came to be known as the Gnostic movement. The Magians 
were Persians, and they originally came out of the Caucasus Mountains, and they established a center on the Urmian Plateau, which is between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And I have shown that this is the geographical matrix of the Magian order and the Gnostic movement derived from it. They spoke of Vestan, but as the order propagated itself, as the Gnostic teachers spread through the nations and cultures of the ancient world, they adopted the Hellenistic idiom of Greek for the majority of their teachings. And then later on, these teachings went into the Coptic language. Element eight, Abraham, the Hebrew patriarch and father of the Abrahamic religions. How did the Gnostics see that figure? Well, they themselves, in their own lineage and tradition, had no such human patriarch. They regarded their tradition as based on the transmission of knowledge or gnosis rather than on genealogical descent. And so they called themselves fosters, which means light bearers. Yes, there is a Luciferian trope there. But I have to warn you that there has been a tremendous amount of ignorant shite written about the true nature of Lucifer, the true identity of Lucifer, and the true benevolent aspect of Luciferian teachings. And these writings all come from uninformed and uneducated people, many of them of the Christian persuasion, who falsely target the mysteries as a source of evil on this planet, a source of evil and deceit. And that is not the case, and it cannot be proven by any verifiable evidence that will stand up to cross-examination. Next comes element nine, and that is Melchizedek once again. So does the figure of Melchizedek, who plays an outstanding and unique role in the Hebrew mythogen, appear in the Greek writings or in the Greek Coptic writings? Well, yes, in fact, there is a tractate in the Nag Hammadi Codices titled Melchizedek. Unfortunately, you can't make anything out of it whatsoever. It makes no sense. It is entirely scrambled. So those who would conclude from this evidence that the Gnostics recognized Melchizedek in the same way that you find in the Hebrew file is completely unfounded. The Gnostics had a critical view of the identity of Melchizedek. That view stands at the core of the Gnostic warning. Finally, we come again to Abraham and Sarah, Abraham and Hagar, all the begats, all the patriarchal ancestors derived from the ethnic strain of the Hebrew. So the emphasis is on race. And not only is the emphasis on race, but it's on race supremacy. So there is a supreme race standing above humanity, the Adamic race, and the genealogy of that race is the subject of the entire biblical narrative of the Old Testament down into the New Testament and all the way to the end, even in the Apocalypse. But you see, the Gnostics did not depend upon genealogical transmission. Their transmission was a transmission of the living gnosis, of a method and a narrative, the Sophianic vision story. Finally, you come down to item number 11, Isaac. So Isaac was the son of Abraham and Sarah. And what do you know about Isaac? Well, there's that famous story about how Jehovah wanted to test the obedience 
of his chosen patriarch. Note, not the knowledge, not the integrity, not the moral integrity, not what he knew, but his obedience, because obedience is a key theme in the Hebrew narrative. There is no obligation to obedience in the Gnostic narrative. On the contrary, the Gnostics were heretics. And the word heresy comes from the Greek verb meaning to choose. So according to the Gnostic way of life, you choose what you believe based on what you can actually know. And perhaps you don't need to believe anything if you know enough. You see my point. So obedience is a theme of the Hebrew narrative. Jehovah tested Abraham by demanding that he sacrifice his firstborn, Isaac. And the story goes that Abraham was obedient. And he was on the verge of murdering his own child. And then there was a kind of miraculous intervention, so the story says he saw a ram, its horns were caught in some bushes, and it became known to him at that moment through his telepathic connection with his overlord and master that Jehovah would accept the ram as a sacrifice for his son. But what is the ram sacrifice? So, child sacrifice is a theme in the foundational mythogen of the Hebrew. And child sacrifice is, in fact, a theme in Christianity. The story of Christianity is about a child said to be virgin-born, who is the vehicle of a divine presence, the Christos, the Christ, the Anointed One. And that child is not only a divine human hybrid, but he is also the picture of pure and total innocence, and he represents the primordial innocence and purity of the human race itself. That is what is to be sacrificed. So the sacrifice of Isaac in the Old Testament and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in the crucifixion event in the New Testament are two expressions of the same mythological theme. They are two events, two variations of the same theme with the same motive. Christianity is based on the ritual of child sacrifice that it draws from Judaism. So there you have it, a summary of 11 points. Needless to say, there is no equivalent to child sacrifice in the Gnostic view of life. And you can look over that material, reflect on it, and draw your own conclusions. To assist you in doing so, I'd like to point out a couple of other contrasts. You might ask, for instance, does the Hebrew file contain a reference to wisdom? Sophia means wisdom in Greek. Sophia is the wisdom goddess of the Gnostics and the central figure of the mysteries. So does the Hebrew file refer to Sophia? Well, as a matter of fact, it does. But it refers to Sophia in ways that are ambiguous and ambivalent to say the least. As a matter of fact, the Song of Solomon says that Jehovah had a handmaid and her name was, drumroll please, Sophia or Wisdom. So there are files within the Hebrew file, that is to say, chapters in the Old Testament, which allude to what some people have called the Hebrew goddess. There's a book called The Hebrew Goddess, written by Raphael Pate, who was a close associate of 
Robert Graves. And what that book shows is that the figure of the wisdom goddess was originally in some way included or considered in the Hebrew file. How can that be so? Well, they could not have ignored it because it was the prominent figure, the female wisdom goddess under many other names, such as Astaroth, was the prominent figure in the mythology of all of the cultures and nations surrounding the Hebrew. And so they had to acknowledge it, but in acknowledging it, they censored it and they deleted it from the record as far as possible. I've written a whole essay on that problem. It's called, Or Ever the Earth Was. And I'll make that essay available on Nemeta to visitors who come for background material in Mythology 101. One of the outstanding clues or residual clues to the presence of the, quote, handmaiden of the Most High, unquote, is the word Shekinah. And you find that as an allusion to the presence of the wisdom goddess. So it is said in the Old Testament that uh, David, the head of the crown kingdom of Jerusalem, the lineage of David, which persists to this day, that David danced in the presence of the Shekinah. Make of that what you may. Well, how about the aeons? Now, aeons is a term specific to the Gnostic material. An aeon is a divine supernatural being, a generator. And these generators are materially present. They are material. They are not non-corporeal spiritual entities. They are vast currents of plasma, torrential plasmic currents like great serpents in the galactic core. Sophia and Thelite are great cosmic plasmic serpents in the galactic core, according to the Gnostic myth. But you don't find in the Hebrew file any allusion to the Gnostic Aeons. Why not? Well, consider the media today Consider the debate around COVID. You find that the media will not allow on the platform of debate any of the voices of the thousands of doctors and nurses who are protesting against the COVID narrative. They act as if these voices do not exist. They cannot afford to allow these voices to be heard in a fair and open debate. If that were to happen, the official narrative would be struck down and defeated right out of the gates. So the authors of the Hebrew file could not refer to the Gnostic Aeons, although they referred to the children of Seth, who are the authors of the Gnostic material. Do you see that? And they hated the children of Seth. They despised them and they wished utterly to destroy them. The evidence for this is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And not in his image, I described how I examined the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've examined the facsimiles, the microfiche, with a scholar that I met at the Catholic University of Louvain, or Leuven in Belgium. And I have shown in not in his image that the Dead Sea Scrolls and other writings from the Hebrew file, because the Dead Sea Scrolls are in that file, you can bet on it, have cited the children of Seir as their greatest enemy. As a matter of fact, the war scroll puts them on the top of the hit list. So when the armies of the legions of Yahweh go into war 
And when they strike with genocidal and murderous fury against the various nations of the world so that they can overcome all nations and possess the entire world as their promised land, they have at the top of their hit list those heretics, the Gnostics, the children of Seir, the children of Seth. Seir is the name of the sacred white mountain in the Caucasus range, which the Gnostics identified as their point of origin, the sacred white mountain of Seir. And you find that cited in the Hebrew file. So once again, to summarize, the attitude of the Hebrew file toward what you find in the Gnostic Sophianic file is an attitude of hatred. It is adversarial. The attitude that you find in the Gnostic Sophianic file is adversarial, yes, but it is adversarial on the basis of critique and metacritique. So what the Gnostics did was they actually critiqued the Hebrew mythogen the legend of the Old Testament. For example, perhaps the most famous instance of this critique is that the record of the Old Testament says that there was a serpent in the Garden of Eden. Now, serpent, garden, tree are all mythological themes that you find everywhere in the world and in Sumerian mythology as well, outside of the Hebrew file. But the way the narrative is constructed in the Old Testament The serpent was a tempter and he influenced the primal parents so that they became disobedient and they went on their own quest for knowledge or gnosis that they become knowing as gods know but not that they become gods. They become knowledgeable, cognizant and educated in the identities and actions of the true gods, the aeons of the Pleroma. And so the Gnostic critique of Genesis and of the fall and temptation of Adam and Eve tells a different story. It says that the serpent was a wise guide and benefactor to our primal parents. You see, and that is one of the most well-known examples of how the Gnostic authors not only critiqued the mythogen of the Hebrew, but they also showed an alternative narrative, a competing narrative. And to this day, I assure you, my friends, that the Sophianic narrative of the fallen goddess Sophia is the only narrative on this planet that can compete with, expose, and overthrow the Hebrew narrative. So, all that is quite powerful stuff. I'm at 40 minutes again. But this is an exceptional talk. And I haven't got to the deal breaker yet. But from all the foregoing as brief and rapid as it is, I think you can see that you are looking at a contest to the death between two mythogens. And that contest is being acted out on the world stage today as I speak. Because what the Gnostics did in exposing the true identity of the Hebrew creator God is a statement of truth that stands through the centuries, although it is miraculous that it has survived. So what did the Gnostics say about Yaldabaoth, the name that they gave to the Hebrew creator god, Jehovah? Well, remember I mentioned the dossier of the prosecution 
You have to go there to find out what they explicitly said. However, in the Gnostic materials from Nag Hammadi, you can certainly gather evidence about what they said, and you can make a case for their expose of the Hebrew creator God, even without the citation I'm going to quote now. Nevertheless, this citation exists, and it is found, you can find it, in the writings of Irenaeus against heresies. And you can find it in Book 1, Section 30, Section 10. This is what Irenaeus says that the Gnostics said, and it is true. It is correct. This is what they said. Bear in mind, not everything in the dossier of the prosecution against the Gnostic heretics is going to be true. But as in any court trial, the prosecution will make a case by making certain claims, evidentially backed claims, against the defendant. And in this case, this claim of what the Gnostics said is correct. Quote, Among them, Eldabaoth chose a certain Abraham and made a covenant with him that if his seed would continue to serve him, he would give them the earth as an inheritance. Later, through Moses, he brought forth from Egypt the descendants of Abraham, gave them the law, and made them Jews. That is the Gnostic warning, and I assure you that it is one of the most dangerous statements that has ever been produced in the whole history of the human race. And the question is, dangerous to whom? The Gnostics profiled Jehovah in this way. They said, specifically, and in no uncertain terms, that Jehovah is a false, demented creator God. It is a type of entity a demonic alien entity called an archon. In fact, Jehovah is the lord or overlord of the archons whom Gnostics identified as the Elohim. This entity is extraterrestrial. Jehovah is an extraterrestrial associated with the planet Saturn the evidence in the Gnostic file shows extensively that Jehovah is an alien deity or self-assumed deity. In other words, he is a monstrous alien who considers himself to be the Lord and Master of the universe. He is demented. And yet, this alien has its eyes upon the earth. So, note that the passage says that the alien overlord of the archons promised the entire earth to the descendants of Abraham. Not just the promised land of Canaan, but the entire earth. Well, a Gnostic today would point out to you, and it's my pleasure to do so, that the earth did not belong to a Yadabayat, and it was not his to give away to anyone. That is a lie. That is a primal deceit in the mythogen of the Hebrew. Furthermore, the Gnostic materials, and you'll find all of this developed extensively and not in his image, explain that the archons envy the Anthropos, they envy the various races of the human species. And they want to be like us. But since they cannot be like us, 
they either want to make us like them or they want to destroy us. And so those two motives are inherent in the Hebrew mythogen. And they determine the attitude of the in-group who wrote that myth toward the out-group, which is all of the races of all of the nations and lands of the world, all of them. So finally, what can I say? One thing I'll say is I'm never going to make a talk that this long again in this series, which is going to go to about 12 talks. I've often said, and I stand by this assertion, which is amply supported by evidence, that the Gnostic message to humanity is the most taboo and transgressive message ever produced by the human races. Consequently, it is the most dangerous message regarding the motives and agenda of those powers who would deceive, dominate, and divide all of the races of humanity in the cause of their racial supremacist agenda, which is written large in the Hebrew file. You hear me? You feel me? So, now that you know what the Gnostic warning is in explicit terms, what are you going to do about it? Eh, just asking for a friend. Enough said. And I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.